thank you so much for joining in. I really appreciate it. It feels so awesome to be here after more than 30 hours spent in the air and flying from Serbia to San Francisco. My name is Stefan, and as few organizers of this conference already told me, I'm actually the youngest speaker at this year's GitHub Universe conference. So that's kind of unique. Uh, I know the thank you. I know the bio says I'm 19 years old, but as you all know, time flies, so I had to turn 20 years old at some point. As a front-end engineer, I mostly work with JavaScript, and I usually joke that I have a black belt in JavaScript, so that's the reason why you see this karate emoji. And the reason why I'm here today is actually to talk about open source. And I'll be talking about building an open source community from the ground up. So here are some projects that have done in the previous two years since I started my coding journey. The last one is this called Accessibility Guide. It's just a guide to help you make accessible websites. And the oldest one and most popular one is this called one called 30 Seconds of Code. So today we are going to learn from our mistakes, and you're going to hear some tips and tricks on how we managed to grow one project from zero to more than 51,000 GitHub stars. So when people in conferences or meetups ask me, Stefan, what is 30 seconds of code about? And I usually tell them it's a curated collection of useful JavaScript snippets that you can understand in 30 seconds or less. And you know, it's enough for somebody, but for more people, it needs a bit more description. So the way we saw there is one problem in our community is that when people who are starting to code, they usually solve the problems in a similar way. They found a problem, they just Google the error message or Google the problem, and the first thing that pops up is actually the Stack Overflow link or some third-party blog post. So they just copy and paste that code into their own editor and hope it's going to work out. But unfortunately, it doesn't usually work, so they go back and copy it once again. And you know, once they're finished, they think they've done a great job, but in reality, they didn't. Uh, the problem from copying somebody else's code is obviously code consistency unoptimized solutions, and most importantly, the lack of documentation. So when beginners copy somebody else's code, it might work, but they have no idea how it works. And overall, we think it's a bad onboarding experience for a lot of people, including the ones who are jumping to JavaScript. So we created this little resources called 30 Seconds of Code. It's just a collection of small cards, where each card represents one utility function. So each, each card has a name, a description of what a function does, and a bit more longer description on how it works. And there is a code. And on the right-hand side, you can see a copy to clipboard button. So you can actually copy the snippets into your code editor and use them across your projects. And we even went a step further and added uh, examples. So people can actually see, given an input, what is going to be the output of the function and how it actually works. So when I say we, I actually mean the community. This is not a project that I have started originally. So in numbers, there are more than 380 snippets made by nearly 200 contributors now. And together, those contributors made over 5,000 commits, merged more than 800 pull requests, and opened and successfully sold nearly the 200 issues. So this number might be you know, big for me, small for you. But for GitHub, it was pretty big. We managed to be the sixth fastest growing open source repository of 2018. And most importantly for us, this is an idea that started a series of other educational projects that I'm going to talk in a second. So the question after this introduction I get usually is how it all started. You know, a lot of people assume that I started coding when I was five years old or that my parents are from engineering background, so I kind of had some boost in the early career, but the truth is done. So let me ask you, like, what was your dream job when you were a child? A lot of my friends, they wanted to be like policemen, doctors, surgeons, actors. My sister nowadays, she wants to be a YouTuber. And a lot of my friends back then wanted to be astronauts and to drive at those fancy spaceships. And my spaceship was this one. So I just wanted to be uh, a garbage man. I still have no idea why. But I just like the fact that I could cruise around the city and enjoy it at the same time and doing something good for the community. And when I think better, like this is exactly what I'm doing right now. So I'm doing something that is appreciated by the community. Everybody loves it, and I enjoy it. So this is what fulfills me. But even then, like my first day in tech were not that great. So originally, I had to pick a high school to go to. And for a long time, I wanted to be a Lego brick designer. But my parents didn't know like which school I should go to in order to become one. And back in Serbia, that school didn't even exist. So 
it wasn't worth it. So I had to like pick high school on my own. And luckily, there was a computer science experimental class in my school. It was just 20 of us. And it wasn't great either. So I started, and I had to cheat in high school because I wasn't doing so well. So the thing was, we were doing C sharp, and I was sitting in the first row of the classroom because I couldn't C sharp, right? I wore glasses. And b back then, I didn't wear glasses, so that, that, was, the, that was the problem. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I was sitting next to, uh, next to my friend. His dad was teaching computer science at a local university. So at the age of 14, like he knew all the data structures and algorithms. So whenever he wrote a piece of code like this, I would be very smart. I would copy it, erase all the variables, and exchange it with my own set of variable names. And you know, it worked for two or three months until we were given an uh, exercise to, to actually do some array manipulation. So it was, I think, a sorting exercise. And in order to like, swap two elements, we needed to introduce a third variable called temporary that is going to hold the value of the first one. And the way we do it is we usually introduce a third variable called temporary. In English, we shorthand it, shorthand it to the TMP. But my friend was not good at English, so he just used the variable name TRT. And I copied the same code, exchanged all the variable names, but the, forgot to change the TRT variable. And that was the test where I got caught. So at that point, I realized you know, I should get better at coding, start learning on my own. And that was the day I got into web development. And I did my first two internships, and it was time for the third one. And everybody's like, you need this tool called GitHub on your resume. So I was like, OK, let's start. And I was browsing the Reddit and found this awesome project called 30 Seconds of Code. It, got, it just got released on that day. And I was like, I want to contribute. So I made my first pull request. And thanks to it, fe it felt like so awesome once I'd done so. It was it was awesome feeling. So it was just because of this guy and his fast and responsive uh, fast and supportive response. And that was the day I said, you know, I want to contribute to open source, and I want to maintain this project called 30 Seconds of Code. And back then, you know, we didn't even have a website. It was just a readme file with a bit uh, like 20 functions. So his name is Angelos. He's actually the original creator of this project and the reason why I'm here standing today. So he was finishing his master thesis, and he, he needed to get a job. So the way he practiced it, he done those lead code, lead code and hack rank problems. And he found out that uh, most of those problems were just combination of some utility functions. So instead of copying them from other resources like Stack Overflow, he wrote them himself. And after some time, he started collecting them. So once he got to 20 snippets, he realized, why not just share it and see how it works out? He honestly thought it was like a very stupid idea, but it turned out to be great. So the takeaway I want to, to make from here is to actually let every idea, no matter how crazy, show its true potential. A lot of us, when we think about ideas, we think that our, day, our, our ideas are like very good in the first few minutes. But then after that, we think like it's stupid and nobody's going to like them. So some tips for finding an idea. You can, for example, open source some of your existing projects. And there is probably something that you have worked on for the last two years. Also, you can open source. Uh, part of your working project. It obviously doesn't make, to make sense to open source the, the whole project, because you're going to get fired in under a week. But if you just open source one, one portion of it, it's going to be beneficial for you and your company. So for example, if you open source one thing in the social community, you're going to be perceived as a good company. And also, your hiring process is going to be much, much more easier because you can just hire people who contribute to your project and like it already. And last but not least, you can start something new. And today, we're actually going to talk about all these three topics. And all the tips that you are going to hear are applicable to any of your projects. So as I mentioned, I made my first commit. It was the first day that that project got released. And the next few weeks were total chaos. So that Reddit post went from 0 to 2,000 GitHub stars. And it, found it felt like a disaster. There were hundreds of pull requests to review and tons of open issues. There was no continuous integration. And there was like a lot of duplicate code. And without any contribution guidelines to guide future contributors on how they can help the project. So at that point, Angelus was like, it's not doable for one person, and he had to form a team. So the team was formed in, in almost no time. We just picked the people who were most uh, engaged in the early days. And 
I mean, obviously, you, you, it's okay to start alone. Angela started alone, and I joined him later on. So it's probably the most frequent way to, to start an open source project. If you do not want to go alone, talk to people from the community or your colleagues and friends and convince them your idea is worth making. And mm, the best thing for me is that if you like somebody else's idea, just join, join them. So there are probably a lot of projects that you're using that are open source, and it would be so cool if you actually work on something that you're using every day, and the maintainers of that project are going to appreciate it a lot. So I didn't want this talk to be just about me. So I created this repository called GitHub Universe Talk and invited all of my friends who joined the organization early on to hear their opinions on it. So next slides up till the end are just opinions of all of us. So if you do not like the presentation, just feel free to open the pull request or issue. And yeah. So we realize that having a great people around you is essential. You know, Through open source, we develop a lot of friendships. And once we reach like 50,000 stars, I told myself I'll get the airplane ticket and meet all the contributors who were active in the early days. So there isn't luckily that many of them. And there was one quote from one team member. His name was Atomics. He said the team was very helpful and encouraging, which made the atmosphere of the repository very welcoming. And I felt great to be part of it. And there is specifically this part that I really like. And for me, this is what open source should be like. And it's not really a secret on how we can get there. So the way we get there is actually building an amazing developer experience around the project. And today, I'm actually going to share with you some tips and tricks that I found really useful. So this is my little checklist. We're going to cover all of these things and starting with code quality. So the reason why a lot of people join open source is actually to to learn best practices, learn a new language, and they want to actually see the, the good examples of code. And if our repository is not well structured, it's you know it's not going to be worth for them, so they're just going to skip it, and you're going to miss your users and the future contributors. So a few of the tips I give is to actually stick to a coding style guide and be consistent. So remove every clutter that you do not find useful. I bet there are a lot of like unused variables in your project or unnecessary files that are just making it uh, hard for everybody that is coming to the project to understand what is happening. And for example, to achieve all of this, maybe you can use something like code linters and formatters on Git hooks. So for those of you who do not, do not know, the Git hooks are like triggers for scripts that are going to be run before or after certain uh, Git actions. So for example, we added a linter on pre-commit hook. So a linter is going to listen for all the unused variables or bad coding practices before somebody commits code. So later on, you won't have a problem in reviewing somebody else's code because it's going to be as good as possible. And we also run formatters on uh, hooks that are happening after the, the commit was made. So we actually do not require people to use like spaces or tabs. We just like do it ourselves via formatters automatically. And I'm not an expert on code quality, so that would be it. And the next advice that I'm going to give is about documenting your code. And I know it's like probably the most boring thing that you, you're thinking right now, but I'm actually not going to talk about traditional stuff. I'm going to talk about writing good commit messages. So the way we write usually code is this. We just want to release the feature as fast as possible, and we usually end up with commit messages that look like this. Or maybe not exactly like this, but they're usually like one-liners that include up to like 20 or 30 changed files. And for the next person who comes to our code base, they mean totally nothing. It's just a way for us to push the code. And the idea I had is that we should actually tell stories throughout our commits. So there is a specific structure that I found out that works great for us and for all the people who are contributing to our organization. And this is actually it. So you start by having a short one-line title of your commit, which is actually going to be up to like, I think, 50 characters, because it's going to be like short, understandable, and actually the GitHub uh, UI shows up to 50 characters on each commit message. After that, you want to provide a longer description of what a change is doing. You know, if the title is not enough, if you're using a bit more files in there, so you should definitely like include the description of it. You should also add an explanation of why the change is being made. A lot of us doing open source don't do it full time, so when we contribute to a project maybe for a week, then we make a longer pause and then come back to it, it would be very helpful to know why the change was being made. And perhaps you want also to include a discussion of the context and alternatives that were considered. 
because we put a lot of effort into writing our code, and if the context is not there, the future contributor won't be able to understand what is happening in your code. And writing commits this way is very good. So for example, for power users, you can just search the whole code base. And for average user and beginner like me, you can install extensions like GitLens, which are going to, so when you highlight each line of code, they're going to display the commit message next to it. And this way, I think you have like every single line documented, which is exactly what you want in, in your project. And this is not the, something that I came up with. So this blog post up here is actually a very cool one. It includes like a longer story of what I told today. And the link down there is actually a link to a repository called Git Flight Rules. It's a repository that stores like all the tips and tricks on how we can solve common GitHub Git problems on our projects. So next on our list are simplification uh, of onboarding experience. So in order to like attract uh, contributors, you kind of need to, to do it in some way. And the first thing that they see when they enter your project is actually your readme file. So the idea here is to make the readme file as appealing as possible. And you know this is our readme file. It's not perfect, but some things that you should take care of is definitely like having a name and a catchy description. Catchy description is the thing that people are going to read the first, and if it's not good enough, some of them might just not continue reading what the project is about. You also want to include some kind of fancy graphics and those trust badges over there. And you do not have to be a designer for that. You can just download some free icons, change the color of them, add text, and credit the original author. This is what we did, and it turned out to be pretty good. And once you include that, you want to include a quick start guide. So don't just link to docs. Include a quick start guide telling the, your users how can they benefit from your project and what they can do. And if they get interested by the quick start guide, then you should link like, to the documentation. So the documentation should not take place in the, in the readme file. It should be either like in the GitHub's wiki page or some third party resource. And so now they are using your project. They figured out how, how to do so. And they might be interested in contributing. So you definitely want to have uh, contribution guidelines. And it's, it's a file that I'm going to talk about next. And also, you should have a code of conduct and a license. I know a lot of people forget about these, but those two are really important. So if people are like violating the code of conduct, feel free to just kick them out of the organization. And also, take care about the license on the first day, because if you don't, people can actually fraud the whole repository and you know, make profit out of it. So this is what happened to us a while ago. It was definitely <laughs> not a good time. So as I said, the idea is to also write good contrib contributing MD files. So those files should actually answer a few questions. So first of all, they should answer like what a project need help with. So if I'm, the if I'm the person who wants to contribute to your project, like what can I do in order to help you? So for example, open a pull request with snippets for the JavaScript, uh, open issues, uh, fix typos, add tests, and a bunch of other stuff. And now that you told the user how to do, what to do, you need to actually help them on to achieve that. So for example, a lot of users are like actually the first time contributors. So you kind of want to add links to the starting guide on GitHub. And actually, GitHub has a lot of like blog posts that are helping first timers contribute to open source. So you should just link to them and forget about writing those on your own. And last but not least, you should include who to ask for help. So a lot of people put a lot of effort into composing pull requests, and they might get stuck at like 95%. And you know, it's going to make them feel sad. So you should, you should just include some resources on like who should they ask for help, maybe include your email. Or if you're not too busy like I am, offer one-to-one -one, uh, mentorship classes. And it would work out definitely. So when you have the contributing MD file, it's automatically going to be displayed in the, in the GitHub UI. So when somebody is trying to open an issue or start a new pull request, it's going to be up there. And the idea behind contributing uh, MD file is that you should explain everything like I'm five. So you're probably familiar with that subreddit, li5. It's basically the, the idea of explaining everything to a five-year-old. And the way I saw this is I made a little diagram showing like what is the contribution process for 30 seconds of code like. So what can people do as a first step? What can do as a second step? What scripts do they need to run? Like what CLI commands do they need in order to, to get a pull request? And it took about 
30 minutes to make this, but it actually led us to more green buttons and successful pull requests. So this is something that you should definitely invest time. I know it maybe sounds obvious, but a lot of people don't do this. And because of that, their onboarding experience is not even that good. And now you kind of want to, to welcome the first time contributors in some way. And for me, like the GitHub is perfect place to do this, because you have everything set up in, in one place. So with over 40 million users, I just think the GitHub is a writing. I mean, they're doing like all the marketing in the social community, and people just seem to, to know about it. And some events like Hacktoberfest are a great place to attract the first timers. And I know a lot of people that come to Hacktoberfest because of the free shirt. But you, you as a maintainer should make this experience more than just a free shirt. You should actually show them what is open source about. And after that, they won't ask this like stupid question. If I make eight pull requests, do I get two free shirts? And yeah, so after that, you, you want to know that uh, contributing to open source for the first time can be very daunting. It's so hard to like figure out and how to, to do so. First of all, people need to find a motivation. And motivating somebody to do something for free and spend their time, like their most valuable asset, is on its own very hard thing to do. So once they find a motivation, like I did for the job interview and having the GitHub, I needed to figure out a way on how to contribute. So a good tip is to actually add those good first issue labels to your issues so that people who are new to the industry, they can actually look up those and try to solve some easier problems at first. So after that, you know, they figure out ways in which they contribute. They need to make this little next step, which is like forking the repository. And for a lot of people, it's like very, very strange thing to do. So without some proper guidelines and introduction to the GitHub, it's very, very hard for them to, to even come to this third step. And after that, you need, they need to make changes. And without good documentation and good contributing docs, it's so hard to do so. And finally, they open the pull request. And you know, it might be a good one if they done all the steps correctly, but the chances are low because they're first time contributing to open source. And they probably missed a bunch of stuff in the meantime. And we, as maintainers, are responsible to keep them because it just takes a bit of negativity to remove the motivation we had in the first place. So this place over here is the area where you should shine. You know, when somebody opens a pull request, don't just blame their here. If they made a mistake, point it out, but also point out on the good stuff they made. Offer help if you think they need it. Or perhaps if they opened a pull request but never came back to it after your review, do a follow-up, tag them, and see if you can make it through to the final steps. And the idea behind the this box is to be nice to everybody. So for example, this, uh, this autumn, this October, there was a Hacktoberfest. And there was one project called 30 Seconds of Interviews that I developed. And we kind of the idea behind the project is to provide uh, questions and detailed answers for people who are preparing for their web development interview. And we didn't have questions on accessibility. So I kind of marked that as a good first issue for somebody. And one girl from India, she was like, she wants to contribute, so she made her first pull request. It was like really, really good, and you know this was my response to her. And you know after a few days, she responded with this. And in the next few weeks, we had a full accessibility category on our website that she developed on her own, which is I think fantastic. So also when communicating on a project, you should use like the simpler uh, language. You know, uh, from the GitHub stats of this year, I think more than like 80% of the people are coming from the outside of US. And it's really, really hard to communicate well, especially on our project. My team was very diverse. We were coming from all over the world. English was not our first language. So we kind of needed to figure out a way. So the best thing to do is actually you know, as simple English as possible without keeping everything too much complicated and also like format text nicely so people can actually navigate more easily around. And the takeaway from here is to actually treat, treat contributors like your guests. So the idea is to make them feel like they're at home. And you know, if you do so, I think you're going to cover all these steps. And we did so. It worked pretty great for us. We managed to be the first Learn to Code repository that is recommended by GitHub when you're starting to learn code. And we actually managed to announce a lot more educational projects, such as this one called 30 Seconds of CSS. It's like a collection of a bunch of CSS examples on how you make like fancy spinners or animations or gradients or a bunch of other stuff for web developers. 
I also launched the one called 30 Seconds of Interviews. So because I was preparing for a lot of job interviews back then, I collected around 200 interview questions and carefully written the answers for all of them. So a lot of people actually got a job from this website. And it feels so good when they message me and say, like, this helped us a lot. And there are also a project for community like this one called 30 Seconds of Knowledge. So one day I was browsing the product hunt, and the first pr training project of the day was 30 Seconds of Knowledge. It was a uh, Chrome extension that took all our learning resources and put them in like a new tab uh, space. And we were so like upset on that day because somebody just took all of our ideas and made our Chrome extension out of it. But soon I realized that the guy who made it lives like 50 kilometers away from me, which is like a half an hour drive. So it was OK. And he moved the whole uh, project to, his, to our organization. And he's right now contributing to it as well, which is awesome. The extension also exists for Firefox. So if you want to check it out, it's a cool learning resource. It's like, for example, every time you open a new tab, you're going to see something new from our organization. And the idea here, you see all of those successful projects. As an organization, we made, I don't know, over like 80,000 GitHub stars or something. And the takeaway is not to be anxious about numbers. I mean, numbers of commits, stars, traffic falls, issues, you know, PRs going old. It just doesn't matter. Like, you're here in the open source to enjoy your time. And there's always going to be like one subway station that is a better programmer than you are. So then there's like kind of no point in competing with that. And I was, because I was searching for a job, you know, I was doing GitHub non nonstop. So for every Christmas, like, your graph looks something like this. Mine was getting greener and greener and greener and greener. So I made 83 commits for 83, pull, 83 commits for 83 unit tests, and it was like nonsense. So and you can even like fake the whole GitHub history graph. Is that your thing? There are like a bunch of websites that you can draw your own thing and just import that to GitHub directly. So there is no way in competing with that. And there is one little tweet from Jason. I really look up to him. He said, uh, "The periodic reminder." Open source maintainers are doing their best to keep up with a fire hose of questions, bug, bugs, imperfect docs, and so many other tasks that it's easy to take for granted. Please thank them and be kind to open source maintainers. Usually they hear only the bad feedback. And this is very true. So if you want to complain to something, just don't do it. I mean, haters are always going to be louder. And their approach in open source is something like this. You know, They just want to fight your ideas, even though they're using your projects. So you know, if they're hating on the project, just ignore them, kick them off the organization, and don't respond. So for example, this was one conversation on Reddit about the little website thing I posted. So there was one guy who works as a senior front end engineer in a big company in New York City. And he was complaining like how one question is very hard that he wasn't able to solve it. And he was sure that 50 of his colleagues that he interviewed weren't, won't be able to solve it as well. And next to it, there was a response from a recent graduate from the boot camp. And he was like, we could all answer that question. And no, it just makes <laughs> no sense up to this day. And the question was very, very basic one, like the easiest category possible. So I didn't find like a, a best way to close this talk. I mean, there is obviously like this quote from Atomics from the early on that open source, open source should be this. So we all want to be. Uh, we all want to feel great to be part of it. And I found one GIF that explains what we should not be doing. So for example, this is your future contributor. He's so excited about your project. He's in his playground, and he just wants to contribute to it. And you know, he starts there. And because of s it's so complicated, he just goes out and does nothing. So this is definitely what you should not be doing. Thank you. <laughs>